If you're like most people, you probably jotted down some financial resolutions for the new year, but how might you go about sticking with them and actually succeeding? Well, here to talk with me about this is CJ Miller from Sensible Money. CJ, welcome. Hi, Bob. Great to be back with you. Great to have you here. And it's a question we get a lot from folks that they've written down their resolutions and uh, lo and behold, the year goes by and they're rewriting the very same ones the next year. How do, how do people stick with them? That's a great question. And I, I think, you know, it really is to be individualized. And a lot of it's about building habits, but it also depends on what the specific goal is. So for instance, a very common New Year's resolution I hear is that you want to save more money. Um, well, if you're treating it like you're just going to have some leftover money and you're just going to store it instead of spending it, you might not be that successful. Whereas if you're setting a specific goal, like you want to fill up your emergency fund by the end of the year, or you want to max out your 401k, then you can start actually taking steps on a regular basis to achieve that goal and make it a habit to save more money um, instead of just relying on it happening kind of as an afterthought. Right. So in, in addition to making it a habit, making it automatic helps as well? Absolutely. You know, it's out of sight, out of mind. And so, you know, that's why 401k contributions work so well, because once you're enrolled, you don't even see that money hit your bank account, but you can do that with other accounts as well. So I use the example of the emergency fund. What a lot of people will do is set up an account, sometimes even at a separate bank than where their checking account is. And they have an automatic transfer. And the day after their paycheck hits, they have you know, X amount going to that savings account where it's out of sight, out of mind for that emergency fund. All right. So I imagine if folks aren't paying themselves first, right? Pay yourself first. That would be uh, one thing to do to make sure that you do save more money if that's your resolution. Absolutely. And, and paying yourself first really is the concept of treating yourself as if you're your own liability or, or credit holder in a way. Um, and so instead of paying off all of your other bills and buying groceries, you know, and then paying yourself at the end of the month, you want to pay yourself right away, right when you get paid first so that that money is accounted for. And, and that really stops the temptation of extra spending, um, you know, down the line throughout the month. Right. And, and what about uh, if someone were to get a uh, salary increase uh, and also had designs on increasing their savings rate? Any thoughts, or thoughts about that? Absolutely. And I think this is one of the biggest missed opportunities for many people as they're accumulating wealth because you know oftentimes they will get raises regularly especially in an inflationary environment people up and down the wage ladder are getting raises from for the very first time in a long time and they can be substantial and so what they'll do is right now they're saving 10 percent, and they say i want to save more money this year and then they get a raise and well if you stick with saving 10 percent, in a way you've already saved more money um just by the basic math of it um, but an even better strategy is to say, okay, instead of saving 10%, I'm going to take part of that raise. Let's say you got a 20% raise or a 10% raise, and I'm going to increase my total savings rate to 15%, you know, up from 10. And so even though, you know, you would have saved more money than you had the previous year, increasing that percentage really helps bolster your savings rate long-term. Um, and it'll still feel like you got a raise in that situation because, you know, your net pay will still go up even if you increase that savings rate a little bit. All right. So in addition to saving more, sometimes folks want to spend less in the new year? Yeah, it's really two sides of the same coin. Um, but, you know, some people are really already avid savers, but they're looking at their budget and saying, well, how can I spend less money? And uh, for a lot of people, psychologically, that's where they feel their guilt come in. You know, people, when they think about New Year's resolutions, a lot of the time it's things they don't feel so good about, like, you know, losing weight or going to the gym more. For financials, that's spending. Um, and so really people need to start by tracking what their spending is because, um, a lot of the time you don't really realize how much is going out or, you know, what those itemized categories are in aggregate, because you're kind of just feeling out what you're spending on a regular basis. So, you know, there are a ton of great apps and I recommend before anybody focus on creating a budget and reducing their spending, they need to understand what they're currently spending on. Um, so, you know, Mint is a great free app from Intuit, you know, the company that does TurboTax. Uh, my wife and I use You Need a Budget, which is a paid subscription software. It's not tremendously expensive, but you can get really detailed if you're kind of a financial geek like me. Um, so we use that to track our spending and, and it makes it really easy to reset our budget for the new year. Yeah, so 
you talk about reducing lifestyle expenses first, and there's something called the big rock items. What, what's that? Great question. So uh, you'll read online, a lot of people will say, well, if you stop spending five bucks on, on a Starbucks coffee, you know, cut that stuff out first and, and you'll see a huge bolster in your savings rate. But really for most people, when you look at what's actually contributing to the amount of money you're spending, the restaurant spending, you know, the excess coffees, the little things don't actually move the needle as much as you'd think. And really what can help you increase your spending is you look at your overall major lifestyle expenses, things like your rent, your automobile, you know, some people will lease a car and then when the lease is up, they want to go get a nicer car because they've gotten a raise, um, you know, or if you have a car payment as that starts to come due, you want to go out and buy another new car, you know, because that payment frees up. But really, if you can take those big rock items and say, okay, how do I optimize what I'm spending there to, to minimize the impact of that, you'll see a really big decline in the amount of money you're spending on a regular basis, you know. So in the example of an automobile, you know, if you cut your lease by 100 or $150 when it comes due, um, or if you don't buy another new car for a few years, um, you know, assuming you're still able to drive, you know, you're going to save a few thousand dollars a year on those two items. Mm. Um, and that's a lot more than, you know, a $5 cup of coffee. Right. So what about, we, you talked about emergency funds a second ago, planning for unexpected and one-time expenses is important when you think about saving money as well? Or spending less yeah. money. Yeah. So if you, you know, you, if you want to spend less money on a regular basis, re usually what falls through are the things that you're not thinking of. You know, the spending blind spots, and they'll happen kind of um, at random times throughout the year. So things like a home repair, um, you know, or a medical bill, and hopefully you have a, an emergency fund that you can tap into, so you're not paying, you know, with any debt um, on those items. But you know, one great strategy is to actually create a buffer in your budget for those one-time expenses because you know they're going to hit, but you might not know when. So maybe that's a few hundred dollars a month that you set aside. And then when they come due, you've got that pot of money that you counted on. Um, another common way to do it would be to take your base living expenses. So the things that you spend on groceries and you know your home essentials and bathroom products and things like that and round up by 10 or 15 or even 20%. Um, because, you know, a lot of the time when you start tracking your spending, if you haven't before, what you find is this miscellaneous category. And, and that tends to start to add up over and over again with all the little things that you buy that you don't ever think about. Um, and so creating a buffer will really help you manage that and make sure you're still achieving your goals without it being a big surprise. Right. So the big resolution that I often hear is I'd like to pay down my debt. Talk about that. Yeah, well, I, I advise people all the time that, you know, as far as a New Year's resolution goes, paying down debt may be a good one, or it may be a bad resolution to have in the first place. There are various forms of good debt to have, um, especially in an inflationary environment, something like a low interest rate mortgage, or even your student loan debt that's fixed, oftentimes will be better to, you know, save extra money in investments for the long term than trying to race to pay that down um, at such a low interest rate. Um, so I always caution people, you know, you need to have a holistic financial plan to see where debt fits in and you need to be able to identify if it's good debt or bad debt. And then, you know, focus those resolutions on paying off the bad debt and writing the ship there. Mm. So not only paying down the bad debt, but avoiding um, what you describe as what sneaky debt. What's that? Yeah. So, well, consumer spending is, you know, I think, at an all time high. And you know, what you'll see a lot of retailers doing now is using companies like Affirm um, or even their own personal credit cards. And, and they'll say, you know what, sign up for this and we're gonna give you a $0 financing fee. And you can go buy this mattress or you can go buy this you know, TV and you're not gonna pay any interest and you're not gonna pay anything now, but you're gonna make 12 or 24 equal payments on it. Um, and the reason that's a risk is because you can end up overspending what you can actually afford. So even if there's no interest, it's not necessarily something you would have bought in the first place, or you might be spending more money on a product than you would have spent initially because you don't have to make the payment right away. And, and those kinds of debts can sneak up on you. Um, you know, my wife and I are in the process of having a new townhome be built and we're doing some furniture shopping. And every time you go to check out your cart on a furniture item, they give you an offer like this. And so, you know, when you've got a bolstered furniture budget like we do, where we're trying to allocate and make decisions, you, know, you can't have everything you want. 
it, it can be tempting to start taking advantage of, of those, you know, buy now, pay later schemes. Um, and, and occasionally they work out, but, you know, for a lot of people, it can be dangerous if you're not really disciplined. Right. And, and what about if you do have high interest debt? What, what do you re- recommend there? Well, that takes some patience and discipline. You know, again, back to the holistic plan. Um, if you have high interest rate debt or you feel like you're drowning, you know, you really need to have a debt management strategy that you follow on a regular basis. You know, in a way, it needs to be more than a New Year's resolution. Um, and so I would definitely advise if you feel like that to seek a qualified professional. Um, but, you know, in the short term, there are some tactics you can employ, like a balance transfer opportunity. So a lot of credit cards will say, you know, sign up and in the first 12 or 15 months, you can transfer some of your existing credit card balance to us and we'll charge zero interest. Well, that's kind of a no brainer in, in most cases. And so, you know, taking advantage of those is a great opportunity. Even some people I meet will have, you know, up to 50 or $60,000 in credit card debt and they'll have equity in their home. And I say, well, look, you know, that mortgage rate is pretty low and refinancing, you know, a lot of people are doing that anyway. And, you know, if you have enough equity in your home, you can refinance and take cash out on the refinance. Your mortgage balance gets a little bigger than it was, but you get to pay off that high interest debt. So it's like moving from one high interest rate bucket to a low interest rate bucket. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can even get creative that way too. All right, CJ, I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, Anything we missed or anything that bears repeating? No, I think, um, you know, it's a great time of year to revisit your financial health and really start building habits. And like you said at the beginning of the video, you know, hopefully a year from now, these won't be the same ones on your list as, you know, are currently there. And if you really do it right, these do become a lifestyle and less of kind of a goal. 